Welcome back to the Smarter Marketer podcast, brought to you by Rocket Agency. I'm your host, James Lawrence. We're back with another episode of the Smarter Marketer podcast, and I'm joined today by Aaron Aegis. Aaron, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. Oh, good, mate. Uh, so Aaron is a contributor to Search Engine Land, Social Media Today, as well as HubSpot. He's a member of the Forbes Council and contributes to the Content Marketing Institute. Um, when he's not busy in those roles, he's also co-founder and managing director of global marketing agency, Ladder Online. Um, as MD of Ladder Online, Aaron has worked with a range of brands, including UE, Kellogg's, Volvo, Unilever, VMware, Lendlease, Facebook, Tony and Guy. The list goes on, Aaron. Um, we've known each other for, for a long time, and I, I wanted to get you onto the pod. Essentially, we've both been in this industry for a long time. We've worked with small brands. We work with big brands. You're currently in Singapore. I'm still in Sydney. Um, but I think collectively, we've got it's showing our age a bit, but around 40 years of experience in kind of working with in-house marketing teams, um, working with business owners, C-suite, and I think also observing the dynamics between those two teams within businesses. So I think just a, a discussion around what the best performing marketers do do in terms of managing internal stakeholders, how to deal with C-suite, boards, et cetera. Um, and let's just keep it fluid and, and look at our observations and um, because we've probably got some some similar perspectives, but also hopefully some different ones as well. So yeah, I think Aaron, just to you first, general observations around the dynamics of C-suite and or business owners with in-house marketers from your experience. Yeah, um, I... I often see, uh, I wouldn't say friction, but a definite gap between uh, marketing and the C-suite. Um, yeah, we sort of mentioned before, but uh, they're much more sort of tied in with sales uh, than, than marketing and not, not seeing the gap that exists there and the requirement on marketing to actually feed sales in the first place. Yeah. Um, and typically, from, from our experience anyway, I see that's because of... Um, you know, old school uh, heads of businesses that have have been driven from direct sales and, and that kind of thing, as opposed to what exists now, which is you know multi-touch point environment and online multi-channel um, digital approach that needs to be fed and funneled in the right way through to a sales team before it can actually get to a point of revenue. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, so yeah, just that that gap, um, that gap, and essentially the the topic of this conversation is is figuring out how to bridge that gap in an effective manner, um, which yeah we've seen quite a few ways that have been successful, and many that aren't. Um, there's always going to be. I, I feel like at least for a bunch of years till that group of owners or C-suite transition out, and and newer ones are, are, are progressing um, up the ladder, we're still going to see a bunch of this friction, a bunch of those problems exist. Yeah, I agree. What like. It's kind of, um, I remember I was at a conference years ago and the analogy was, um, you know, in the 70s and 80s, you, you're selling insurance door to door or you're selling a car. Some, someone comes into the dealership, the salesperson has the control, right? You've got the collateral, you've got the information and you go to a consumer and go, well, here it is. Um, we know it's different with digital. Google's research, 900 touch points before you go into the dealership to purchase a car. The kind of the customer, the consumer has a lot of, of control around the, the buyer journey and the role of sales is is therefore different. Um, and I think you're right. I think you see this, this kind of um, this legacy or lag out approach to the consumer journey is often yeah. C-suite managing directors board level. Um, and that is the source of the friction. Like what, what do you see the, the, the marketers that you've worked with over the last 15 to 20 years, what are the things that they're doing to kind of try to educate or bring on the journey the C-suite. Yeah, well, I think you you hit the nail on the head. Education, um, internal education, which is still tough because you're you're educating um, uh, educating something people these these kind of people aren't really akin to and, and have no real exposure to. And I, and I think that's the other side of the coin as well is that if you want to be effective and and get your message across and convince and persuade the C-suite, a big part of that is understanding what success is to them and success to them is driving real numbers and and KPIs and value, not the how of what you're doing necessarily. Yeah. So it's it's cool if I have to explain how we're doing what we're doing. We keep it really simple, really basic, but you tie it into hardcore numbers that are going to actually be meaningful to the to the team. That is how they win. So 
that, that is how you have to deliver whatever convincing message you're delivering. Yeah. And I think that was, you know, I was kind of jotting down some of my own thoughts on this before the, before the part and that to, is the number one thing for me is often it's just alignment, which is success looks like X. Um, yeah. And I think marketers that are down at the tactic level and talking tactics and impressions and posts and whatever, you're missing the point because the reality is, is that your boss or the board doesn't actually care. They're trying to hit a quarterly or an annual target and you need to look at that number first and go, well, actually with the budget I've got and with the where the current state of play, I feel we can do that. And if you yeah. can't, you've got to set expectation immediately, right? Yeah. And, and a big part of that is that during those conversations, understanding, as I was saying, understanding what success is, what do they want to see? What's the goal? But using the exact same language and vernacular and echoing how they are talking about the goals and the achievements in your own presentation to them and in your own discussions with them. So you're speaking their language. Um, again, like you said, they're not going to care about impressions and clicks and all the other stuff that comes with it. They're going to care about what success is to them. So I think, you know, it's, it's kind of sales 101 is, is, is empathize and understand and, and um, mirror back the, the, the language and the vernacular that they're using as well. Yeah. Uh, um, something I wanted to dig into is like often business, like <laughs> it's the classic um, we're falling short of our quarterly sales targets. Um, sales is doing their thing. Gen I, I, it's absolute um, generalization, but I think often the sa head of sales, senior sales people within organizations have the ear of C-suite MDs more than marketing, not always, but in my experience, I agree. Yeah, it's probably 70, 30 or 80, 20. Um, I don't know what happens to us is clients will come to us, go great news. We've got all this budget approved for a massive campaign, a burst because sales aren't quite there. Um, and we've, we've, we've got to run for three months and these are the sales targets we need to hit. And you'll look into it and you go, hang on, but it's a complex B2B transaction. It's a, it's a 24 month, 36 month, you know, lead time to generally go from first touch to purchase. Yeah, it's not, like you're not naturally going to generate the leads. Um, yeah. so just tapping into kind of, I think misconceptions there around um, sales, C-suite expectations around marketing and how to deal with that. I I wish I had good answers on that one. Uh, I, I see the exact same thing, and um, yeah, you're trying to manage um, evergreen, always on campaigns versus quick bursts and. It just, it doesn't operate that way. It never operates that way that you're going to get the results in that short period of time. Um, and again, it's just an upwards education process to get to that point and to continue, continually push uh, the agenda of evergreen campaigns so you don't get in these situations. Yeah. Um, but I, I completely agree. There is a gap that, again, that always exists between we need this, we need this by January because January is our peak month. Um, you know, where are we at? Here's, here's a bunch of money to throw at it and marketing just go, just doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because and, and the complexities of um, your uh, commercial intent keywords that you're targeting, let's just say you're doing ad campaigns, they're, they're going to improve based on the fact you're doing, putting more spent towards branding. But the branding can't be done in a short period of time only. And that's trying to hit all these touch points over time and work them down a funnel. And it's just, it's just not realistic, but that has to be explained in a way that makes sense to these guys and trying to explain a thing that's often considered rather abstract, like branding and the impact on sales yep. to someone in the C-suite is quite tough. It's quite the challenge. I reckon it's worth going into, like, let's go down that, that rabbit warren because I think we'll be in agreement on this. Like we, um, we've known each other. <laughs> we've known each other for 30 years. Like we, we, bizarrely, we went to school together, but yeah. I remember we caught up we hadn't seen each other after leaving school and we bumped into each other at a game of soccer. And I was like, what are you doing? You're like, I'm running a marketing agency. And I was like, me too. Um, <laughs> but we've come at, like we have come at this from a performance viewpoint where everything for me was dollar in, dollar out, Google ads, SEO, quick turnaround. We were selling against yellow pages and against offline advertising where it wasn't um, measurable. Um, and in, in my experience, it was very much, we would just, we would look at, um, a kind of brand agencies and above the line stuff and go, it's complete BS. Like this, you know, they're just, they're not, they're hiding behind results. And I've come around on that now, which is that's actually not right. Like our best performing K 
campaigns for clients in any in, in any space with any degree of complexity have brand campaign. And I'm not talking about clicking on a brand name in Google. I'm talking about brand building activities, um, content marketing, top of the funnel, SEO, long-term SEO, not talking about, you know, uh, bottom of the funnel type queries. And clients that have those campaigns running well are the ones that actually then have demand gen working. And I, is that... Yeah. Echoing oh, your experience, hundred percent. But it, it has to be happening at the same time, right? It's yeah, not one yeah, or totally, the other. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, that we experienced that firsthand um, in our agency, and you know, well, it's not exactly the topic that you're discussing. I'll, I'll explain how we yeah. um, experienced it. So, initially, when we started our agency, we were very, again, dollar in, dollar out. We needed, like, for our own business, we needed to be able to get clients. We needed to. Um, get a return for any marketing that we were going to be doing to attract those, those clients. And we were getting to a point like we're really good at what we're doing, which is SEO and content marketing as a core of what we're doing. Um, we knew that we were better than most people out there. We we're going up against other companies and losing the pitches and had no clue why we were losing. Like we knew we could, we've seen their work. We saw that they were doing dodgy stuff. We knew how to beat them. Um, and we kept losing until the point where we were like, all right, the reason I think we're losing is two things. One is that they're, um, someone Googles their name, they've got a footprint, they've, they've got a brand, they've got um, it, case studies and, and examples of work everywhere on the internet. Um, and the other part was that they seem to have flashier decks, right? <laughs> nice slides and, and, and things that looked better. Um, and so both of those are kind of branding in two different ways. And we were like, all right, let's spend a bit of time doing branding. So we jumped on, at, you know, in, in your introduction, you said, I write here and I write there and all these kind of places. So that for me was like a core thing that we were going to do. How do we do our own um, branding and content marketing and eat our own dog food? Yep. So started contributing to bottom tier publications and worked our way up and up and up and been writing for those for years. And the whole point was that if someone Googled my name or the agency name, you'd be able to have a footprint and example, like you're written in Forbes, written up in Fortune magazine and Content Marketing Institute and a bunch of places. Okay. Um, there's implied credibility and trust behind that. So that was one avenue that we went down and never stopped. As well as speaking on stage, we wrote a book, just like you wrote a book, right? We, we did a bunch of these branding exercises. On top of that, we were like, okay, same deck, same inclusions. Let's just pay a designer once off to make it really flash and nice. Combination of that, like we literally went from closing $60,000 a year deals to million dollar deals. Yeah. Didn't change anything about our presentation yeah. online, our conversations, our sales approach, nothing but pure branding. Yeah. And for me, that was like pennies dropped. I'm done. I wish I did this from day one, but you just don't have the money to from day one. So it's a, you know, it's a hard balance. Yeah, and that's us. Like, I think because di digital has changed. Like, digital was the space that you went to to solve a very discrete problem. And we built our agency on Google Ads, SEO agency, PPC agency. You spend X amount of money, you'd get X amount of leads, you make the sales, keep doing it. And we still do that because the bottom of the funnel stuff does exist, but it's not what it was. And um, the podcast, the book, speaking, similar stuff that both of us do. Um, and it's what, works for our clients as well. It's not how to market an agency that's just, that's marketing. And I think for me, um, businesses often run on a quarterly cycle, right? Monthly, quarterly cycle, you've got quarterly targets and it, it's tempting for C-suite to kind of go, well, marketing is a dollar in dollar out exercise. I spend 40 grand a month on marketing and these are the outputs. But I think it's fair to say that what we're doing for our clients and what we do for ourselves, you're talking about, doing things today which might not yield even an inquiry for 12 yeah. months 24 36 months right and so i think that is something that marketers probably starting to get their head around but then how do they then feed that back through to to their reporting line right yeah, exactly and i mean i i sort of i put myself i am in the position of the c-suite not just for our own agency we, we own a couple of marketing agencies a couple of mortgage broking businesses um, and education businesses, a few businesses that we're involved in at the moment. And my job as not being the marketer in those other businesses, it's, it's a very numbers driven approach. Anyway, I'm saying the exact same thing that these guys have said to me, 
I don't care. Find a way. We need these leads during this quarter. We need this sales target. You sound and like a nightmare client. <laughs> I am a nightmare client. Myself. I, um, it, and it's true. And yet I, I understand the intricacies better than most because I have to deliver on, on, on the other side. Um, it's still the way that you kind of need to drive things. You, you need to be hard line, drive set numbers from the C-suite down. And the sooner that people can talk that language going back up the chain, the sooner that um, things get sold in properly. Yeah. And that's it. Like I think looking at um, my most successful clients from an actual revenue profitability viewpoint, the, the the clients we deal with who have just made tremendous money in business, they're ruthlessly numbers driven, right? That yeah. which doesn't get measured, doesn't get done. And, and it's so you're not going to change that mentality. That's how businesses operate. That's how successful businesses operate. If you're in a SaaS scale up, it's going to be all numbers driven. If it doesn't actually matter, you need to come onto the journey with them. But then it's nothing matters but the numbers. You, yeah. You're in here for the number. I mean, it's great have a nice impact on people and change lives and all all that abstract stuff. But a business is for there for commercial intent and commercial reasons. If the numbers don't work and if you're doing yeah. everything right, it's pointless. And yeah. off the back of that sales is the only thing that matters in the business and sales can't operate with marketing where you can have an absolute terrible product if your sales and marketing is on point yeah you can run any business right it's uh it's, you see it right often the, be the best product is not the, the the one that succeeds right it's the one that's marketed and sold sold best right exactly and and like i said we're seeing that in we also run an education business teaching people how to buy businesses seven and eight figure businesses for no money out of pocket right and we're seeing the same thing. It's just continually where it's sales operations um, and finances, all you need, the, those pillars running any kind of business and everything that we bring from our experience in our marketing businesses, but also from learning from clients that have these C-suites and how they operate all gets put into these other businesses as well. It's the same thing again and again and again. If the numbers aren't there, you're done. Um, so I get it. I empathize with with the C-suite and the marketers. Yeah. <laughs> so what? I, my next kind of question is, what should you do? You're a marketer. Um, how do you get on the same page as the CEO or the managing director or the board if there is a disconnect between what they're expecting and what the numbers look like with what you can deliver within marketing? So what marketing role are we talking about specifically? I think senior marketers, senior senior in-house marketers that are just- Someone who reports direct to the C-suite. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be done based on current numbers, understanding current numbers and what they're delivering showing how much it costs to be delivering that um, and then looking back at what the C-suite are asking for and saying, well, look, if we scale up this, you can see the math doesn't work. We're not going to hit those numbers scaling what we're doing. You want to try new campaigns, new channels, new anything else, you've got to understand, and there's the education piece about branding and, and about buying data in those channels and failing less and less and less over time until it turns positive. Um, uh, again, speaking their language, proving with data, showing documents and, and evidence based on current successes and failures that they're seeing. I think that's the way to go. That's right. I, I, two things I'd add to that. One is competition. I think often um, we'll have a client where they're just not getting the budget they need or something that isn't quite working. And it's often pointing to the, the competition in that, in, in that vertical will kind of prick the ears up of CEO, MD, board, which is, yeah, yeah you're, you're expecting miracles, but look what the competition's doing because it kind of takes it, it, makes it a bit more objective, I think, takes you out of that. That's huge. Yeah, and like just, just showing estimated budget spends that these guys are spending to, to dominate those channels, like especially ad-based stuff. Yeah. Um, and we, we do the same in SEO as well, right? We're, we're going, what are you mainly buying in SEO? It's, it's technical content and links. And so have a look, you know, show number of index pages on your client's site and say, look, and here's the guy you're trying to dominate and he's got 10 times as much content. What are we doing to bridge that gap? This is how much content costs. Same as, you know, link profile analysis, looking at you're, you're sitting there with a thousand links and they've got 10 million links and you think you're going to be able to overcome that with this kind of budget. It's not going to happen. The good thing about that is I think also it's objective, like it's numbers, which is we, we know the numbers that the C-suite is probably not generally across, but to say, it's one thing to go, well, how come I'm buried on the third page of Google for a key search term? It's like, well, actually, you know, we've got a hundred of these types of links and the competition yeah. has 7,000 and yeah. this is the way to do it. And this is the time it's going to take to do it. And until those things have happened, don't come back to me and say, why are we on the third page of Google? Yep. Yeah. And that's why um, 
uh, you know, I don't know how you do it in your agency, but when when we sign agreements with companies, we're doing proper broken down cost documents with um, line items based on technical content and links and broken out further tasks and that kind of stuff, yep. showing months associated, expected deliverables and so on and so forth. And so we're able to say that, hey, you're spending 20K a month here. You can see what portion goes to link acquisition. You can see it roughly gets this many links per month. It's going to take you X amount of time unless you increase the budget to be competitive with these guys. Taking a bit of the um, the grayness out. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Speaking their language. That's it. And the, the next misconception for me, and I, I suspect you'll see the same thing, which is, you know, we spend a hundred grand and we generate a thousand leads. Therefore, if we double our budget, we'll double our leads. Not always how it works in terms of the lowest hanging fruit. So maybe you just let's discuss and, that. Well, certainly not in SEO. Right? <laughs> it, it's one of the super hard channel to manage. Um, and part of it's going to brand exercises, how you're going to ma ma manage and measure that. Part of it's going to purely content. And even though it's not going to see results now, um, it, it's going to come through later. And there's a range of things that are hard to uh, measure and manage there. But um, yeah, you, if you're talking on the ad front, you're sitting there flooding a potential audience that's not large enough or yeah. you're, you're showing your frequency of ads to the same people and it's just not impacting them and you're just not going to scale up in the way you want. Um, and if you did go, okay, cool, then we need to try new audiences, new angles, new hooks, new creative and copy, then that's great, but you're testing and buying data and failing for a while before it turns around. So you cannot expect the same return. Yeah, that's it. Hey, speak. So speak. Speak the language. Make it data driven, numbers driven, but the numbers that actually, you know, the stakeholders themselves care about. Um, and measure and manage themselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I think the um, the piece around expectation setting is huge. Like it's it's um, pushing back, right? And that's hard when you're dealing with your boss or someone senior. But otherwise, you just set you're creating a rod for your own back, right? It, it's massive. Um, and interestingly. We find it varies when you're looking at the different countries as well. So a lot of our client base is US based and we find that um, the US comes a lot more pre-educated and take a lot less convincing to be to do things and um, are a lot easier to have expectations set. Yeah. We found that Australian based clients, even during the sales process and everything else takes a lot of educating, a lot more um, uh, saying this is what's going to happen this is how it's going to happen this is why this is what to expect this is when like there's a lot more rigor that has to go into it and it's not because um it's not because they demand more rigor it's because i feel like they're less educated or just behind the us in in many ways and maybe you find if you looked at average ages perhaps of the c-suite in some of these companies there could be just a lot of young c-suite young executives in c-suite in the us because coming through Silicon Valley and, and all that kind of stuff versus yeah. some of the older generation in Australia. I, I don't know. Interesting. That's an interesting, um, interesting observation. Um, I always finish the pod by what's one piece of advice that you'd give to an in-house marketer. The best piece of advice you can give to an in-house marketer. doesn't have to be on this topic. It can be on anything. Yeah. Um, I've got a good piece of advice. So I, I've found many times that despite all logic, all numbers, all data, anything that you provide to the C-suite, there is always going to be some kind of campaign or requirement that we call ego stroking. Um, you're a tire sales company. They don't care if it makes money or not. They want to be seen on the front page for buy tires. Yep. That's all they care about. So in doing all of this, even though you could disprove them, even though you probably will disprove them, they do not care make sure that there is some kind of budget or awareness going to giving them that ego stroke they want. Otherwise they're going to put you aside to, for another guy that's going to come in and say, yeah, I can do that. I, I, I'll get you there. It just looks, I don't care about the numbers. So the, um, I remember we, um, we were pitching a project years ago and digital was clearly the way to reach the target market. Um, pitched a great pitch, didn't get the work. And we're like, how come they're going, we're going, we're going above the line. I was like, you're mad, like, where, why? And basically the decision was made to put most of the budget into billboards and most of that budget to go near the airport because that's where the board <laughs> were going to fly through. And it just made oh. absolutely no sense. But, you know, I don't know. I'd be pushing back on that if I, if I, had, if I had the choice. Um, Aaron, where can we find you online? 
Uh, you can find us at louder.online. Um, you can see me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm pretty active there. Um, or you know, reach out by email, aaron at louder.online. Legend. So doing similar stuff to Rocket, but probably doing more stuff globally than, than Rocket when most of our clients here in, in Australia. You're doing a lot of work. You're based in Singapore now, um, doing work into America. What kind of regions, what kind of focus of work? Yeah, um, it's it's mainly the US. It's mainly um, mid to enterprise companies, um, and sticking with our core, which is the SEO and content marketing side. I mean, we run all ads and and uh, demand gen and and everything else on the side of it. But um, I'm I'm competitive, and I've always enjoyed having to beat someone to those few <laughs> top spots. Right? <laughs> Legend. Well, thanks for coming onto the pod. Hopefully, we have you on again. And um, thanks for for sharing your experience. Thanks, James. Anytime. Thanks, mate.